It's time for Garage Band Weekly here on Studio Live today. The show all about Garage Band. In this week's show, we are breaking down WWDC. We're talking iOS 16, iPad OS 16, the brand new Mac M2, and a whole lot more. We're also going to be looking at audio, mono versus stereo. I've had question after question in the last couple of weeks, so we're going to break it down and give you all the information you need to know about stereo and mono audio and how to convert between the two on your iPhone or iPad. All that and a bucket of fish here on Garage Band Weekly. Let's go. Garage Band. Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Yes, it is Garage Band Weekly here on Studio Live today. I hope you're doing well today. We're brought to you by um by me, by uh, by my Garage Band guide, my beginner's guide for iOS Garage Band, which is over at Studio Live to Studio Live. That's a different one. Studio Live Today dot com slash Garage Band. I'm going to pop it up on the screen for those watching on the video version. There it is, the FAQ. You can check out my ten dollar course if you're just starting out with Garage Band. It's a good way to get yourself kick-started and then we've got all of my playlists there and all the frequently asked questions everything you could ever want to know this is my digital brain so uh, my regular brain's a little bit mushy sometimes and doesn't have all the answers but my digital brain uh, is a lot better and uh, a lot more coherent so go and check out my digital garage band i always brain at studio live today.com slash garage band if you've got any questions as we go through the show please just pop a q like a big capital q or the word question in front of your comment and we'll be able to to find, I can throw your chat comments up here just like I've done with our wonderful moderator, Mr. Thomas Christ. You can check out the GarageBand FAQ there. Let's say good day to the folks who are here live, and then we'll crack on in with the news and notes of the week. So, hello to to our friend Thomas Christ. G'day, Gregory O'Sullivan, me, myself, and iPhone. Thank you for being here. Uh, who else did I see sneak on in there? Phil Gone. Thank you for being here <laughs> as well. Typing challenges and uh, and all. G'day to Mark Bro. Hello, Sync Cat. I hope you are doing well. And the one and only Jade Star. Thank you all for dropping on by once again. If you do have questions, we have the answers. Well. And I say we, not me. I don't have the answers, but um, we have a good group of folks here. And uh, in fact, let's start with that. I'm, I'm going a bit out of order here. Let's start by talking about the fact that if you are a GarageBand user, and uh, look, I know Facebook is not for everyone. A lot of people don't really dig on the whole Facebook thing. But there is a group over on Facebook for GarageBand users, and it is called garage band users it is a very cool place to go and get your questions answered to share your garage band music to find out all the cool things that are happening there's rock and ronnie ward there on the feature page there so there's thirteen thousand plus members of the group it is a private group so i'm not going to show any of the details in there but i highly recommend joining it and we've actually had folks who have joined both that group and the create record release group who aren't even facebook users you don't have to tell arnie doris that you're on facebook don't worry i know she'll want to send you photos of her cats but you don't have to tell her just set yourself up a private account join the cool groups that we have there it's just it's the best way i've found look there's, there's other things like there's um there's other servers and there's other forums and there's you know reddits and twitters and discords and all the rest of it but i've just found that um for better or worse facebook works the best uh, so let's use it let's use it yeah there are indeed a few fat garage band groups there's the ios garage band group you've got the ipad musician and iphone musician group you've got the audio units and plug-in groups so you can kind of go nuts joining groups and again just curate yourself your content you don't have to do everything it's a bit like uh like jade says about apps they're not pokemon you don't have to catch them all and you definitely don't have to join every single group <laughs> Gregory O'Sullivan. I still don't know why I watch this show. I've never managed to finish any project I've started in GarageBand. Well, maybe, maybe this will be the week that you do it, Greg. This is you'll be your inspiration. Uh, and we do talk about other things uh, GarageBand adjacent. Uh, so this show is not just for GarageBand aficionados. It's for the GarageBand curious as well. All right, let's dive in. Uh, so that yeah, GarageBand uses Facebook group. Uh, iOS 15.5 and iPadOS 15.5. Now, most people have updated and have had either minor or no problems. Some people have updated and had significant problems. So uh, I need to I need to get a tape to just play every time we do something like this. So can someone cue the tape from iOS 15.4, iOS 15.3, 2, 1, uh, 14 to 15, 13 to 14? Here's the thing. If you are in the middle of a big project and you do not want to risk something going wrong with that big project, do not update. 
unless there is like a zero day security flaw reason. So if there's legitimately someone could hack in and steal your stuff or break your stuff, don't update. <laughs> I know it's, it's tempting. You're like, maybe there's some new features. Maybe there's some bug fixes that are going to make everything hunky dory. The chances are more likely that there'll be some things that don't work. And again, if you're in the middle of a big project or you're working on something at the moment, please don't update because every single time there's an update, I get emails, I see forum posts, I see posts over on the Facebook group saying, I just updated. And this one, in particular MIDI, I've had a couple of folks report now that they've had problems with MIDI keyboards with their iPhones and iPads since the update. It's not recognizing their MIDI keyboards. Now, I've got a sneaking suspicion that the folks that are having issues may be using non-standard hardware. And, uh, you know, say it with me, folks. If you're connecting up a Lightning-based iPad or iPhone, you want to use the genuine Apple Lightning to USB adapter. I've got videos about it. I talk about it a lot over on my gear guide. I recommend it because here's the thing. Uh, whether you like it or don't like it, whenever Apple updates something, uh, they, they are going to add stuff in there to stop third-party things from working. And again, you can say, hey, well, that's just, that's unfair practices, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is Apple's ecosystem. They can kind of do what they want. And I don't, I don't mean to sound defeatist, but it's just the reality of it. So if you want to make sure that you have a reliable connection, especially with your MIDI keyboards or your audio interfaces or mixers or USB microphones, they are not going to play nicely with those cheap $5 and $10 USB adapters. I'm sorry. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. It's just the way it is because they don't have the MFI chip in them. The, the adapter, the actual uh, Lightning to USB 3 adapter from Apple has a chip in there. It's got the MFI. It stands for made for iPod and it's their sort of genuine chip. Now, players like Belkin and um, Logitech and others that are sort of bigger players, they'll also have the chip. But uh, yeah, the, the, the cheaper stuff is going to work sometimes but not all the time. So please, buyer beware uh, when it comes to that. Um, this is WWDC. The, the big news out of that for GarageBand creators is that we've got the new M2 uh, MacBooks, MacBook Air and MacBook Pro, and the M1 iPads are finally having a reason to be. And I'm going to just pause on that because we're going to talk about that. That's going to be our entire feature topic that we're going to go through. So uh, we'll, we'll dive into that in just a moment. Yeah, there is the GarageBand Users Facebook group. If you haven't already joined, uh, come on over here and join the fun. We don't bite. It's all cool, people. Uh, so yeah, GarageBand Users on Facebook is a good thing. Hello, Clayton Von Kluj. Uh, chicken enchilada. Ooh, now I'm getting hungry. Uh, it's breakfast time over here. But yes, obviously dinner time in other parts of the world. Let's go go and talk about um, talk about the new stuff, shall we? The new shininess. And can I preface all of this by saying that you don't need to buy any of this stuff. Um, in fact, the, the best thing about this time of year is with the WWDC, if you have a device that's supported, more on that in a moment, if you have a device that's supported, you're going to just get some free features because going from 15 to 16, there are some things are there a heap of things that I think are awesome? <laughs> no, not really. But we're going to talk about some of the things that may be cool for creators and for GarageBand users. So let's dive in and get started. So the, the first thing, that the big news out of this is we got new computers. And like, I actually, I like the redesign of the MacBook Air. So if, you, if you're if you playing around it, if you're playing at home, uh, let's just go back a, a notch here. So the new M2 chip is in both the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. Now, the Mac MacBook Pro, if we just go back to the main Mac menu, the MacBook Pro, it, it hasn't had an update at all. So here in Australia, it's still from 1999. And at the moment, you can just buy the M1 version, but you're going to be able to buy the M2 version soon. They haven't said exactly when, they said next month or, or end of the month or something. So we're expecting that in sort of the next sort of three to four weeks. So that, as you can see there, delivery currently unavailable. You can't pick them up. So these are the ones that are $12.99 US, so $19.99 or $22.99 here in Australia. And the only difference is these are the exact same designs. And do, do you like the way that they... They've kind of hidden it there. Like there's the touch bar there. They've got the big bezels on this one. Still a nice trackpad, a nice keyboard. But yeah, this is the old design. They obviously had some more of these chassis lying around and wanted to uh, wanted to actually uh, get rid of them. So the 13-inch MacBook Pro, I, I wouldn't recommend it right now because the only difference, here's the thing. People have been asking me through the week, what's the difference between the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air? Why would I go a Pro? It's basically the fan. 
It's it's slightly so it's actually the exact same chip and the exact same setup. The only difference is that one has a fan and one doesn't. So it, and that really just means if you're doing sustained tasks. So if you were if you were cutting video, if you're cutting 4K or 8K video in Final Cut Pro and you were rendering out video. Maybe you'd want to go to the MacBook Pro. For your average GarageBand user, you're not going to notice a difference. Like rendering audio doesn't take a lot, even if you're running a bunch of plugins. Uh, uh, there were heap of, heap of tests that happened with the M1s when they came out, where people were, were loading up Logic and just piling on a thousand plugins, and it was working fine. It was running uh, like butter, buttery smooth, as the the, the Apple uh, folks say. So yeah, the MacBook Air, given it's got the redesign, it's now got the um, the MagSafe on the side there. It's still got the little notch there, but it's got an improved camera in there. This is going to be an absolute powerhouse. Like I, I think that uh, yeah, when I finally upgrade my children's computers, because they're only twelve and ten, so they have the hand me downs of the hand me downs. But a MacBook Air, potentially even the M1, because even though you can buy the M2 chip. You can still buy the M1, and the M1 MacBook Airs are only nine ninety nine still, and thirteen uh, fourteen ninety nine here in Australia. So, so I guess the, the bottom line of this is, what is M2 going to do for you? Uh, not a whole lot. It is not a huge jump. It is iterative, and unlike last time where we went from Intel over to the M1, it is not going to be an absolute game changer. It is just going to slowly bring things up. Where this is interesting, though, is it's very clear that the future of all their processors are these M-series chips. So now that more iPads, and we'll talk iPads in a moment, have the M1 chip, and now that Apple's iPad OS is actually has a reason to have the M1 chip, it's pretty clear that that's the direction that they're going, that they're going to use the A-series processors in their iPhones, and we'll have the iPhone 14, um, no doubt announced in September uh, in their usual iPhone event. And then, uh, yeah, we, we'll, uh, we'll see the M1 go into more and more iPads, except perhaps. Perhaps the, the very bottom entry level, but the all the Airs, the Mini, and the uh, Pro are probably going to get an M1 in the near future. Uh, let's, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's, there's some links, by the way, down in the description if you want to check out more of the specs and more of the information around there. Should we talk iPad OS? Let's take a day to Brad example. Hello to you while we're, doing, while we're here. Uh, Clayton Von Kluge said they should have a more beneficial for the customer trade-up option for long-time Apple owners. Yeah, look, the Apple trade-in, like everything, if you want the best value for your Apple stuff, sell it privately and then buy the new one. If you use the trade-in, and it's the same with everything, whether it's your phone or whether it's any electronic gear, you always pay a premium. Like, you don't ever get the true value. So Apple will have things like $300 off the new iPhone. Just trade in your working iPhone, and then you read the fine print, and it's got to be, like, the last version. So my iPhone 12, which I have, which if I wanted to trade that on iPhone 13, they'd probably give me $300 for it. But guess what? That was a $2,100 phone when it was new. So uh, if I sold it, I could probably get $600 for it right now. So, yeah, the... The, the trading path is not great, and especially since, you know, our refurbished Apple stuff is actually pretty good. They, they do at least, like, if you buy it privately, you don't know what the state of the battery is. It could have been dunked in the toilet. You don't know. Whereas if you buy through Apple refurb, then you know it's good quality. So, yeah, it, it's kind of that. You pay the lazy tax, I guess. Um, Brad example says I got that iRig Stream Pro. I need desperate help with it. Maybe you can help me. I probably can't. I think I think as I've mentioned to you, it's um it, it's fantastic if you're just plugging into RCA cable. So by the way, this is the iRig Stream Pro. This is one of iRig one of IK Multimedia's new devices for live streaming. Works fantastically on my Mac. Works well on the PC. It's iPhone and iPad support is great if you're using a native app, like if you're directly into the YouTube app or something like that, or, or streaming. Uh, it doesn't work well with the browser. Um, iOS and iPad OS still have issues with audio within the browser, and that's the biggest issue that you're going to face with that and others. So, uh, if we jump over here, what I'm talking about here is if you if you're in say Safari uh, or Chrome, uh, let's just go to Safari, shall we? Um, see what? I, hopefully, I wasn't browsing anything dodgy in the past. No, it's just my just my studio. Um, so, if you are trying to use something like Streamyard here on your iPad, uh, the, the audio settings. If you come up to the top here and you go there. Like at the moment, I'm using my Steinberg UI22C. The problem is that it doesn't support things like stereo audio, and it doesn't doesn't seem to keep that audio setting once you start using something in the browser, because the browser-based audio is not really designed for iOS. It, there's kind of a hacky workaround that it uses with its universal audio, and I it, it's it's a bugbear of mine because I would love to do more streaming. What I'm doing right now with my Zoom live track and with multiple cameras and multiple angles, I just simply can't do on iOS. 
iOS and or iPad OS. And maybe, and it's a good segue because maybe it'll be something that I can do in the future. But right now, uh, yeah, the audio support in iOS for the browser is not cool. And a lot of the cool things like Restream and StreamYard and a lot of these streaming apps are browser based. They don't have their own app. So until one of those things changes, yeah, we're, we're going to have these continued challenges. Um, but yeah, it, look, again, it works. You just have to know where to use it, like what platforms and what apps will work well with it. Uh, let's talk iPad OS because uh, it's a good segue over to the updates to iPad OS. And there is a link down in the description that you can check out that has all of the details that we have here of iPad OS. S, uh, yes, incredibly capable, unmistakably iPad. So, yeah, you can go and check out all of the, the stuff, all the things. But what we want to talk about is what's going to be interesting or good for creators. And it's not much of this. It is probably this. Stage Manager is definitely one of the things that I think is going to be an interesting change there. So if you haven't seen this, Stage Manager is basically like a, a layout. So if you've ever used your, your Mac, uh, well, for me, if you used a Mac, Finding all your windows is really hard. They get buried away on the taskbar and trying to find things is challenging. This is going to open that up. So this is going to be on Mac and on iPad OS if you have an M1 chip. And it just means that you'll have your open apps, like the last five apps are going to be there and available. So I think this would be pretty cool for creators. If like me, you use a notes app for like songwriting stuff. Maybe you've got a guitar tuner app. Maybe you've got a garage band and you know, a browser window with free sound if you're downloading some samples or whatever, uh, or whatever you're using or Q basis or Aurea Pro, you can have all those apps and they'll all be jumping around there. Um, the sad news is it is only for M1 only. So it'll only work on your iPad Air with M1 or your iPad Pros with M1 uh, chips in them, which is a bit sad. And it means that a lot of people are going to be left without this. The other thing that is looking good that uh, is also only for M1 chips is external display support. So you might be saying, Johns, we already have external display support. Display support. Uh, oh, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. Uh, what have I done? Oh, you know what I've done? I've... Uh, <laughs> I'm using two different ways to share my screen. All right, let's go with this way, shall we? Uh, you might say, we've already got external display support here. You can show your iPad just like that. Like, that, that's my iPad screen right there. And yeah, we do. But the problem is, that's only mirroring what's on my iPad screen. It's There's no way to have an extended desktop experience. And this is what, what I've been wanting for a long time, what I know a lot of iPad owners have been wanting for a long time, which is external display support where you can have one thing on your iPad screen and in a different experience. So if you're editing in LumaFusion, you could have you could have your, your files app open on one screen um, or whatever else, you want, your browser window, and then a full screen LumaFusion experience on the other screen that you can use with your mouse and keyboard and trackpad and whatever, or same with GarageBand, or same with Cubasis or Aurea, to be able to have that separate setup where you can do it. And this, this is where something like live streaming could actually be possible. So for me, because I need to be able to have a screen and an iPad and a webcam, I can't do these sort of shows using my iPad and iPhone, not easily, whereas this is a step in the next direction. Also, M1 only. So external display support is M1 only as well. Uh, where did I put the, the, the links here? That's not it. Uh, there it is. So this is the article all about, it. Well, actually this one is the article all about, these are both linked down below, so you can read these in your own time. How do you know if your Apple, if your iPad supports iPad OS 16? And uh, here's uh, Renee Ritchie actually asked Craig Federici uh, why. Why, Craig, why? Why can't we have this on our other non-M1 iPads? And this answer could not be any more Apple. So, in a statement uh, for, with Renee Ritchie last week, Apple asserted that Stage Manager requires large internal memory, incredibly fast storage, and flexible external display I.O., all of which are delivered by iPads with the M1 chip. Was that a good Craig Federici? No, it wasn't at all. Uh, but that's, that's the problem, is that they've only optimized this for M1. Has that caused a bit of a stink for, for people like me that don't own an M1 iPad? Yeah, a little bit. But here's the thing. Like, uh, yes, is it frustrating that I can't use it and I'm going to have to upgrade if I want to use it? Yes, it is. But when the M1 came out, what did we all say? What's the reason? What's the differentiator? Why do I need an M1 chip in my iPad? Guess what? Apple just said, here, suckers. <laughs> they just slapped, slapped it down and said, right, you want desktop type experiences on your iPad? Well, yeah, you can have it here, but you're going to pay for it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
look, I don't, I don't get upset. I don't get angry about this sort of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I just get disappointed. It's like with my children. I'm, not, I'm like, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Apple, I'm not angry. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm just very disappointed in your decision. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, but yeah, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be fine. But yeah, it's an absolute it's an absolute Apple answer. Uh, so yeah, um, exactly. I'll just wait for the M2 iPad, right? Uh, and yeah, it will be it will be a wise investment. Um, and a- any app that will use a new memory swap will require the M1. Absolutely. So that's probably I've buried the lead a little bit there. But what he's referring to with that is that. Um, and I know that Jade's been kind of on this bandwagon in the past that I think it was only six gigabytes that were available um, in iPad OS uh, architecture in the past for any apps to use. So even when we had eight gigabytes and 16 gigabytes of RAM in iPads, it, it, you were not using any of that M1 memory. You were only using the base memory that you have in sort of more standard or older iPad Pros. Whereas now that's going to be opened up and you're going to be able to use the full amount of memory as well as the new memory swap, which means that if you've got, say, a 256 gigabyte iPad Pro and it's got 16 gig of RAM, if a if an app asks for more, oh, please, sir, I want some more. It says, I want 24 and it's used up all 16. It'll grab eight gigabytes from the, the internal storage, which is pretty fast um, on the M1 chip. That's super fast SSD storage and use that as a hot swappable RAM location, just meaning that instead of what what Apple what iPads used to do is if that happened and you'd know this if you've used it if you hit a if you hit that thing it's just like execution error boom and then your app goes away so especially if you've used Cubasis or if you've used uh, Aurea Pro or something like that or even GarageBand on a an older hardware and you're pumping it in with a bunch of AU plugins and you're really pushing it hard it won't tell you anything it won't warn you it won't try to fix it it'll just crash it'll just close apps it'll just stop processes whereas now it'll actually be using that memory to be able to do that <laughs> uh, and it's true look i i um you're right mark it's it's that whole you can't please everyone thing because i know that myself and, and the likes of patrick over at garage band guide we were like why would you buy an m1 ipad apple grr, give us something for the m1s and then they're like here you go and like grr, give us this for all of our old stuff too it's like yeah i don't know I don't know. I don't know. All right. Uh, so that's the iPad OS, and look, they're the two. The two best features for iPad OS are two that I currently am not going to be able to use. So uh, all the other iPad OS features, I'm kind of. I don't think they're going to do much for creators. Just just quietly. Um, so h- here's the other thing. Uh, if you want to, if you if you want to get angry, if you if you weren't angry enough about that, uh, let's talk support, shall we? Let's talk about which iPads are going to support iOS or iPad OS 16. And there's an article here from Mac Rumors. I don't need a coupon for honey. Mr. Beast, but thank you. Uh, so here are the devices that support iPad OS 16. The iPad Mini 5 and 6, so the 4 slips out of support. If you've got an iPad Mini 4, you're going to be stuck in iOS 15 forever. The iPad 5th generation and newer, which is quite a, a, a way back. The 5th gen is the, the 2019 iPad. So, yeah, you're still getting but 3 years backward compatibility with your regular iPads. Your iPad Air 3rd gen and newer. So, yep, those uh, like me who are an iPad Air 2 owner, we were clinging on. We were hanging on for dear life. At iOS 15, we just got in there. We just snuck in there. Now, iOS 16, there will be no iPad Air 2. So, RIP, my old little red and blue one. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know the old guy. The old uh, red and blue iPad iPad Air 2, my, one of my first iPads. It was very cool. Uh, and all models of iPad Pro. So, uh, that's pretty cool. So, even my, I've got the first gen, the 12.9-inch first gen iPad Pro. I was a little worried that uh, that, that, might, uh, that might go the way of the Dodo 2. But, um... Yeah. Oh, look at that ad. Can we get rid of that, please? <laughs> Stop seeing this ad. Thank you. Why? Uh, already bought this. Yeah, I've already bought my I Love Guns t-shirt, that's for sure. Yeah, if you know me, you know that. That's pretty funny. Um, all right. So, uh, iPad OS, that's what that's all about. What about iOS? What are we getting for our iPhones? Anything cool? Not really. <laughs> I struggled with this one. I looked through all the features and I went through everything. And look, there's some quality of life stuff in there. So the messaging is going to be good. It's nothing to do with creating really, but the messaging is going to be good. I did take out of um, the collaboration side of things is going to be good. So Apple are are launching a new app. I forget the name of it. It's like ScreenFlow or Lazorne. I don't know. It's got a weird name. So they've got a new collaboration app that's coming to, um, to iMessage and to FaceTime. So that could be interesting. 
because again, if you're working, especially if you're working on multiple screens and you're collaborating with someone, being able to integrate that all within the Apple ecosystem. So let's say that you're sharing a GarageBand project and you're sharing it over iCloud and then iCloud Drive, and then you can just FaceTime the person and you're chatting about it, and then you're just flicking apps around and you can bring up a digital whiteboard and you can like put ideas out there and put your song structure and your chords and things, and then update all that in real time that's that's going to be a good thing yeah so it is nice to see that apple are starting that i don't think it's going to help musicians or creators right out of the gate but i'm always looking for like the things that apple are planting that are going to be the next thing so i don't think that's a now thing they haven't even announced a date for for that um sharing collaboration app but you see that they've now added into like pages and a lot of their apple apps have added better sharing and collaboration so we can hope we can put our hands in the air and say please sir can we have please sirs and madams can we please have some better collaboration for GarageBand because I've got to the point now and you know when, when I collaborate with Jade Star I don't I go around the whole Apple ecosystem I literally just grab my GarageBand project zip it up stick it on Dropbox or Google Drive and send it over to Jade and then she makes the adjustments and adds the drums and then sends it back the same way because the iCloud Drive collaboration in GarageBand if you've ever used it you'll know it because you'll have version one, version two recovered, version three auto recovered, version four auto auto recovered. As soon as you have more than one person working in one project in iCloud Drive, it becomes an absolute dog's breakfast and I don't recommend it. Um, uh, hello to uh, Kites Pangan. Hi, Pete, uh, and all. Also coming to iPadOS is Driver Kit, which provides developers with a modern, secure way to build support for audio, USB, and PCI. Yes, thank you for that. I haven't dug into this enough, but I did I did see it. It was sort of in the weeds. It wasn't in the announcement, but in some of the things that they've had. So it's, this is why we've got cool people around here that, that pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, so you know how every time someone's asked me about a piece of hardware and I say, if it ain't class compliant, it ain't coming to iPad. Well, yeah, now there's actually going to be driver kits. So we may actually have audio drivers for iPad OS. So that could mean that, you know, your, your Claret, like your, uh, your Focusrite Claret, your higher end multi-channel interfaces that need their own drivers, um, interfaces that have like built-in effects and, and de uh, processing, they could actually be coming to iPadOS. So that is pretty cool. And that's a pretty good thing. So thank you for uh, thank you for throwing that out there. Um, the the new M2 MacBook Air is an interesting proposition right now for the flexible workplace arrangement. Yeah, look, it, it's going to be so. For for those that don't know, if you if you're newer to the channel, I at the moment I use my desktop setup here is a Mac Mini M1 absolute base model, eight gigabytes of RAM, two fifty six storage. So and that that runs beautifully. That runs the studio exactly as I need it to because I do live streaming. I use GarageBand and Logic. I do what I'm doing here right now. So it does everything I need it to do. I also have an M1 uh, Max. Um, in a 14-inch MacBook Pro. So the la last year's model, the 2021 MacBook Pro, and that's on loan from Apple. So that's not mine. I'm, I'm, I'm pretending, I'm, I'm thinking of my future that doesn't involve that computer because I would not buy that level of computer. But for me, especially the uh, the midnight one, I, I kind of like this because I don't I don't love all the silverness that goes on in the in the world of Apple. Uh, but this, uh, is it called the midnight? It's, it's like a really dark blue one. Let's, um, let's go on and view it and see but the um the one oops we're in the macbook pro i'm in the wrong spot uh but anyway there, there is a there's a, a macbook air uh that, that's yeah like a nice black dark color and i'm like that that could be my go-to machine for everything so that one with you know a decent amount of storage maybe a terabyte of storage in there and probably like the 16 but we probably wouldn't need 24 gigabytes of ram but like 16 of ram a terabyte storage for an on-the-go flexible like just take everywhere machine i think that that could be pretty cool and it's going to be like they're clearly targeting the education market because they're even giving a hundred dollar discount for education so yeah so all those all those hoity-toity schools that are like we're not going to use dell and lenovo like all those plebs we're going to go um, some apple macintoshes you can't say mac you have to say macintosh when you anyway I, I, I do love schools, but uh, an education, but sometimes they get a bit hoity. So the iOS feature, though, that I'm actually most interested in, and by the way, yeah, all, all the iOS features are available in the, the link that I've got down in the description, is pass keys. So I think this is going to be cool. If you're like me and you signed up to all these services, like I've got a, a Steinberg account for my Cubasis and for plugins and things there. I've got a Ultimate Guitar account. I've got a freesound.org account. I've got all my Apple accounts and passwords and things. 
remembering, like, I'll just go to use a plugin and it'll be like, oh, you haven't registered this. Uh, you have to register or, or log in to prove you're registered. And I'm like, oh, I've got no idea, A, what email address I used and B, what iteration of what version of password I use. Because it depends. Because if you're like me, you're constantly changing them because you're kind of paranoid. You don't want all your passwords to be the same. So it's a constant headache remembering which version of which password you have. So pass keys could be an interesting feature. That's coming to, to Mac and iOS and iPad OS, sort of all integrated. And the good thing is that that's not just an Apple thing. That's an Apple, Google, and Microsoft thing. So for me, pretty much everything I do in my world is Apple. A lot of the products I use, it, this show is called Garage Band Weekly after all, is Google. Guess who owns YouTube? Guess who you're probably watching this streaming through? Yeah. And Microsoft, because there is still got to be that crossover between Microsoft. I still use a PC for some things sometimes. So to, to, to know that there is some, uh, some structure around logins that is coming, that is going to involve your devices, it's actually going to involve things you have, and uh, second factor and third factor authentication, that's a cool thing. Because I am sick to death of remembering my login and my password. And to, to be honest, um, it, StreamYard actually do a good job. StreamYard don't have passwords, <laughs> so uh, it, it's, which is good because obviously I don't want someone coming in streaming on my channel that isn't me. But StreamYard use um, use two and three factor authentication, so they all, a lot of companies are already going down this track where you don't have a username and a password. We well, have a username, like you do have to have an account, but then you have a pass key or you'll have some sort of physical way of proving your identity. Can everything be spoofed? Are they going to be hacked? Yes, but it's the effort. Like a, a clear text password that people could just use brute force to try and hack into is a lot less secure, uh, especially with all the things we've seen in recent times of, you know, the Cambridge Analytica and a lot of these passwords getting leaked and, and these big lists of passwords. That There's companies, companies, <laughs> there's people out there, there's bad guys out there that are just grabbing giant lists of leaked passwords and usernames and just plugging them into everything. And it's very simple to write an algorithm that can do that. And a lot of people, um, like, yeah, write down, so my, my parents' Netflix account, um, the the um, password was, was on one of these leaked lists and someone logged into it, changed the details, and then we're just using it. We're just watching their Netflix for free uh, until, you know, my dad called Netflix and they sorted it out. So they got two days of free Netflix. Hurrah. Good on them. I hope they enjoyed watching uh, Stranger Things or whatever they did. Anyway, uh, let's let's move on. Uh, hello, Pierre. Thank you for being here. Uh, hello to everyone else. If I've missed any questions, uh, please do. Uh, yeah. Does that mean uh, we, we have to juggle those pesky drivers? I know. I don't, I don't hate the fact that iPadOS doesn't have drivers. Uh, I'm hoping that this... I'm hoping it's not for everything, but what what it does give me hope for, Mark, is webcams. So webcams, like Apple have never supported external video natively, mostly because all webcams or USB cameras have very specific proprietary drivers. So for me, again, I can't do this show unless I'm mounting my iPhones and iPads at various locations, which look some people do, but it's so much easier. I've got like my web camera right up there on its tripod, on its uh, on its mount. I can adjust it when I need to. So maybe things like webcams and then, yeah, audio interfaces. But yeah, look, I'm hoping it's not that this, this box and dice thing that every time you plug in like a USB stick, it has its own proprietary freaking driver that could get really old really fast. So I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, more compatible audio interfaces. So yeah, I think I think it'll be a very sort of slim use case. But yeah, it's a nice thing that you're going to get for um for because there's not much for for music creators as part of the the latest updates, and that that is definitely something that we have there. G'day, Patrick Chandler. I hope you're doing well, my friend. All right, um, let's uh oh, so which iPhones support iOS? Let's uh let's jump in and take a look at that. So iOS 16. Guess what? You know, my favorite iPhone of all time is my iPhone 6S Pro. No, 6S Max. Is that what they used to call them? The big one. But the iPhone 6S. My daughter's got an iPhone 6S. My wife used to use one. I've used one for a long time. And uh, 6S Plus, wasn't it? It was the Plus, not the Max back in the day. Um, guess what? Yeah, no iOS 16 for iPhone 6S or iPhone 7. So, uh, and that includes the iPhone SE first edition. Now, I haven't, uh, th there's been a little bit of back and forth as to the iPod Touch, the latest generation, which I just bought, as to whether that will get iOS 16. I don't know, because it, it was based around, it was kind of based around the iPhone 6S infrastructure, but it is running the A. 
12 I don't know. We're going to have to find out. So if, you, if you're an iPod Touch user, um, watch this space. But there's the list of devices that you can use. The iPhone SE second gen and later. So the third gen as well. iPhone 8 all the way up to iPhone 13. So look, it is getting a little bit easier at least to understand it. And here's the thing. Like there's not a lot, there's not a lot that's coming to iOS 16, and I'm I'm hoping that iOS 15 will get backwards compatibility for things like pass keys because that would be super frustrating if you were using a phone that just missed out was on an iOS 15, but your iPad and your Macs on on the new new version uh, iOS 16 or uh, Ventura. Somebody stop me! No, that's the mask anyway. Um, or Mac OS Ventura. So it would be frustrating if they didn't have backwards compatibility for things like that. But in terms of the new features, in terms of like the messaging and in terms of like, oh, that was one thing I didn't mention. So messages, you can now like delete messages and you can pull them back like it never happened and you can uh, edit messages. So that is going to be cool. But um, yeah, nothing, no support for six and seven. Now, keep in mind, Apple is still pretty good with this sort of stuff. So I've got device, I've got like an iPhone 5S that is still stuck in the land of iOS 12 and will never go anywhere else they still do push security updates. So it's it's not all, you know, all doom and gloom and it will still work with a lot of things. The challenge is going to be as a musician, as a music creator, is if uh, companies are, or if the, the developers are starting to develop things that are going to use iOS 16 specific features and you're running iOS 15, you may not, you may get to a point where you can't update that app to the latest version. Is that going to be a massive issue for a lot of people? Not really. And our developers, re is there anything in iOS 16 that's going to change and make developers? Not really. The, the exception there is probably going to be iPad OS 16. So the ability to have external display to sport, the ability to use things like the center, uh, center stage, what is it called? Stage manager. Um, that may be cool for something like Cubasis. So if you're a Cubasis user or a Aurea Pro user, I don't know that they'd... Uh, what, what, what Apple tends to do with GarageBand is just arbitrarily make it require the latest iOS. So that could be a, a space to watch. And of course, we'll report on that as soon as we know any more because quite often when there's an iOS update, we do get a GarageBand update. Sometimes it's literally just stability and bug fixes. But unfortunately, what it tends to do is it means that you can't use that latest version on anything but the latest version of iPad OS or iOS. Yeah, support and upgrades are two different things. It's spot on. So you can uh, you can do that. Uh, but yeah, it just means you can't get the latest version of all the apps. So yeah, you can, you'll can you still get support. You'll still get all the security updates and they'll make sure that, you know, your, your device doesn't die, but you may not be able to run the latest and greatest, uh, latest and greatest apps. So uh, yeah, that, that's the news. Is yeah, well, there's one more one more thing. I'm like I'm like um, I'm like the Apple announcements. One more thing that I thought was interesting was um was the spatial audio. So I'm just trying to get rid of some things there. So spatial audio. We already have spatial audio in our i uh, iPods. What are they called? <laughs> Pod earpods. Earpods. Yeah. AirPod Pro, AirPod, I can't remember. Um, AirPods, how did that take me so long to get to AirPods? Anyway, uh, but what we're going to get now is uh, personalized spatial audio. So there's an article there, won't talk much on it, but I thought because it's music related, because spatial audio is now built into Logic, we don't have the ability to do Dolby, Atmos, or spatial audio in GarageBand. But if you're creating in Logic, because I know many of you are sort of crossover Mac and iOS users, then uh, yeah, the spatial audio basically is in more places now. So if you're releasing with DistroKid, which is a great place to release your music, then you can actually now release really spatial audio like Dolby Atmos 3D audio versions of your songs and places like Apple Music are already accepting the, the, the spatial audio. I'm sure Spotify are just about to jump onto it and do things. It's already with uh, places like, is it Deezer? No, Tidal. Tidal already do spatial audio. So it is out there. It's still a bit niche. I don't really like the idea. I struggle to mix in stereo sometimes. I don't think I want to mix in uh, in 3D and have all the different channels like 11 channel sound. It sounds a little bit much for me. But it's there. And uh, by the way, what the personalized spatial audio means is that it'll actually, you use your iPhone and it uses the true depth camera to take a picture of your melon and work out where all your bits are. So, because the spatial audio works by knowing where your head is and where your movement is and then making the, the sound move around that space. And obviously, we all have different shaped heads. We all have different size ears. We all have different layouts of our melons. So, this is going to say, hey, we're going to get a customized profile of just your melon. And that means that uh, when you're wearing your AirPods, they're going to sound even better for you. So, it can only be a good thing, I think. Hopefully. All righty. Uh, Master Singleton says, uh, I still have... 
the OG iPad Air for reading ebooks and PDFs and listening to audiobooks. Yeah, and that's the thing. A lot of um, a lot of folks, and I do the same. You, you've got your older stuff, and you just use that for for other purposes. Yeah, I've got an old iPad Air one that my daughter uses, and for her, she watches YouTube and she plays a couple of games, and they all run fine. So she's got no problems with the iPad Air one, and the same with her phone, iPhone success. She's not going to be needing the latest and greatest apps. So uh, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, I'm not excited, but yeah, look, Thomas says I'm not excited about spatial audio either. Uh, not something I'd use much. And yeah, it, it's one of those things where I don't use it now, and um, but it, it, it's good to know because it'll probably be more in the future. Um, unlike, well, though, they, didn't they say that about 3D? And then look what happened with that. Poor 3D TVs. Anyone anyone buy a 3D TV thinking, oh, this is going to be cool, and you've now you've just got to draw with like four pairs of those glasses that were just absolute bollocks? Yeah, maybe. Alrighty, um, so yeah, that's, that's everything that you wanted to know about the announcements that we had for WWDC. Uh, overall, what score would I give them? Yeah, like probably a 6 out of 10. What's going to help creators? I think the pass key is going to be cool because you don't have to remember passwords. I think the iPad OS features look cool. And look, we didn't even talk about the fact that you can now use... I didn't talk Mac OS at all, in fact, because there really wasn't anything there that, that floated my boat. The only thing you might want to sort of look at is that whole thing where you clip your iPhone to the top of your MacBook and then use that as your webcam. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't know. It looks so not, it's so Apple, but so not Apple at the same time. If you haven't, if you haven't checked it out, I won't go into it here, but go check it out. Basically, it's a, yeah, it's a little bell can clip. You clip your iPhone to the top of lid of your, your MacBook, and then you use that as your, your webcam. And look, I, I, newer iPhones, the 12 and the 13s, they're chunky, heavy beasts. So if you put your, your 13 Pro Max on the top of your very thin lid of your MacBook Air, I don't know, are we going to have like lid gate again? We're going to have like all these lids that are bending and warping because people are clipping giant phones and leaving them there for hours at a time? I don't know. Hopefully not. All righty. <clears throat> Yeah, fact of the matter is we have only have two ears at the end of the day. Stereo is fine, right? Well, mo maybe mono is fine. Fact, that's a good. That's a good segue. We're going to talk about stereo and mono in a little while, but not before we have a rant. I know that was a long news segment and a long feature segment because there was a lot to talk about. And thanks for all of your uh, all of your input and involvement in that one. So let's rant a little bit. One thing I didn't talk about was Apple have a new feature. Uh, which is their pay later. So Apple Pay, as you may be aware, means that you can link your credit card to your iPhone, to your iPad, to your Apple Watch, and you can pay with convenience. And look, I love this because when I'm out and about and I'm wearing a mask, I can I have my phone, my um, watch there, I double tap on it, it brings up my credit card, I scan it, and I'm on my way. I think that's pretty cool. And yes, I do use a credit card, so I'm going to get a little bit hypocritical here. Don't worry. It's it's fine. It's what a rant's all about. <laughs> uh, but what Apple have now announced is that they are basically getting a an Afterpay clone service for Apple Pay. So this means that when you use Apple Pay to buy anything, whether it's Apple products or not, that's an interesting thing. Like a lot of people are like, oh, so I can split my Apple products up over four payments. And yes, they'd love you to do that. But this is not just for that. This is for everything you buy. So you go out, you want to buy a new mixer. You want to buy the, the Zoom Live Track. It's 450 bucks. Uh, you'll pay that over four months and you'll pay a fourth of the cost each month. Now, that's still good on paper, but the reason that Afterpay and the reason that these buy now, pay later services are making so much money is that they're not a charity. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts to give stuff away and to, to make it easier and to make the burden less on folks that are buying things. They make their money through interest and late fees. And yes, you might say, oh, but I, I read the fine print and there is no interest. There is no account keeping fees. Yes, provided you do the right thing. It's kind of like gambling. It's kind of like when you go to the casino. They're just like, oh, it's just entertainment. It's fine. But there's got to be losers. They don't build those big uh, shiny hotels and casinos on the winners. They build them on the losers. And unfortunately, the reason that companies like Afterpay have had such success and you know, are crushing the market and doing all the things is that um, people don't have the money to buy things. And instead of, you know, the old days where back in my day, you had to save up and, and save up your $450. You can say, well, I've got $120 now. I'll pay that this month. And then $120, then $120, then $120. Now, if you have the, the ability and if you have the dedication to be able to do that, 
and then that's cool. Like, absolutely cool. No harm, no foul. And in fact, I've been, meeting, like, on, every time I go onto eBay at the moment, they're just like, you can save 10 bucks if you use Afterpay. And I'm like, I don't even need to, but maybe I'll just do it just so that I can, so I can try it. And I know it works really well for a lot of folks. And I know these sort of systems work well for a lot of people. Unfortunately, a bit like everything, a bit like scammers and everything else, they the people it doesn't work for are the most vulnerable people. So just like casinos prey on the most vulnerable people that can't afford to be gambling, unfortunately, these buy now, pay later services tend to target and focus in on the most vulnerable people. And they're the most the people that are most likely to default on their payments, which generates the income. So all, all I'll say about it is, if you like the idea, then use it. And I actually, I put a poll up on my channel to ask about this. Uh, should we, should, we'll, go, we'll go check the poll. I'll check the poll results because I, I put it up yesterday and I haven't actually been back to check. So I'll check the poll results to see what people, because I, I think it's going to be split. Uh, my, my guess is that it's probably going to be about 50-50. There's people that use it and love it and can like have the the ability to use it in the way that it's intent, well, the way that it's going to work for you. And take advantage of it by all means if it works for you take advantage of it but yeah just don't expect them to uh be super lenient when it comes to the fees and things you have to pay if you don't pay on time uh let's go to this community poll and see what folks said about it yeah so it's it's pretty much as i would have expected here uh 21 love it so that basically had a five rating scale love it sounds pretty good i'm concerned not cool and this will end badly so yes yeah, 21 of people love it and 15% say sounds pretty good. So, you know, one in three people, and that, that probably relates closely to those that are going to be able to use this and use like take advantage of a service like this. Um, 33% say this will end badly. Uh, probably consider that they're people that have been caught up in interest-free terms and in buy now, pay later situations that, that have ended up paying a lot more fees than they meant to. Yeah, I did that. I paid... Um, I paid about $2,000 for a TV that was worth about $1,500 just in additional fees because I put it on this 24 months interest-free terms. Thanks, Harvey Norman. Yeah. And then and now I get these GE credit line invitations. They're like, you know, you could unlock $8,000 worth of credit. I'm like, no, thank you. I'll pass. But yeah. And then you know, most most people sort of sit in the middle there where they're like, ah, maybe it's good. Maybe it's not. So uh, again, everyone's an adult and everyone can choose to do what they want to do. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, a caveat emptor. I, I could have just said that, couldn't I? <laughs> caveat emptor. Um, God bless the scammers. They are humans too. I don't know. Have you heard some of those scam baiting calls? Some of them are very much, uh, very much not human. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, let's let's move on, shall we? Uh, anyway, options. Options are good. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying beware. Just just like I say, don't update your staff uh, until you're sure, because if you're in the middle of a big project, uh, yeah, don't buy that shiny new thing until you know you definitely really need it. Go watch some reviews. Go, go check out some some Jade Star videos or some uh, some Mike and Joe videos over at Creative Source, and make sure you really need that new shininess and can afford to buy it because uh yeah the problem is like it's not magic if you can't afford to buy it now uh you need to be very sure that you're going to get the money coming in to be able to pay it in the next four weeks uh four months anyway i'm going to shut up now uh and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a little bit about audio and video so my uh, plug in and app and tip of the week because we are running along here today is going to be all around the same stuff so i've been getting a bunch of questions in the last uh, couple of weeks all around video and audio. Uh, uh, Brad Example chatted about this, well, asked about this earlier. He's got the iRig Pro Stream. Oh, me, my iPad's gone off. Come back, iPad. Can't see my face. There you go. All right. Uh, so, yeah. So, the, the challenge that you have with audio when it comes to iOS, there's, there's a bunch of them. But one in particular is for anyone that's ever used a two-channel audio interface is that if you record audio in the left or the right channel, in channel one or channel two, it's all going to go on one side or the other. So uh, let me uh, let me show you what we're talking about here. If we jump back into here, uh, I just recorded just before the show here. I recorded a little bit of test audio. So uh, let's see if this is first of all. We'll check that we've got the right connection here. There you go. So it's coming through my Steinberg UI twenty two C. So I'm using the uh, the USB C. To, uh, to USB adapter there to adapt and uh, plug in my Steinberg UI22C. And this is what I recorded. I recorded in the left channel. In fact, uh, I deliberately took this photo so you could see that's the setup I have here. I've got my microphone in the left and I've got my guitar in the right. And this is a pretty typical thing. This is why you want a two-channel interface, right? You want to record your microphone and your guitar at the same time. Here's the problem, though, is that if you just use the camera app, you get something 
that looks and sounds like this. Talk, Mr. Man. <laughs> Take your sunglasses off. Talk. Say it. Do it. Oh, I haven't. <laughs> and then sometimes you're uh, muted. Your interface. But the problem is, if you're using a two-channel interface, it'll only put that audio on the left or the right, depending which channel you plug into. It's true. You should believe that guy. He tells the truth. So if you missed that part and, and you were listening uh, on mono anyway, if you're listening in stereo, that's all going on the left channel because it's recorded all through. So see the microphone there? It's plugged into the left channel. It's all going on to the left. If I plug, if I play my guitar and my microphone at the same time, they're going to go onto the left and the right channel. Now, if you're using something like GarageBand, uh, this is easy, right? Because if you're using GarageBand, you just set it as a mono channel. So I'll show you what I mean there. If we come into a GarageBand project and you're going to record... If we set up a new track here, so we'll go plus, we'll go audio recorder, let's just say it's my vocals, and we'll turn on the monitoring there. So if I've got my microphone, hello, check one, two, three, I've got this on channel one. And what this is doing is this is mixing down this, that left side into the center so that when I record it, it's not going to be on the left or the right. It's going to be mixed down to mono. Now, what a lot of folks do when they're starting out is they think, oh, stereo is always better than mono, right? And they select stereo. Look, Look what, what happens, happens when I select stereo. stereo. Yeah, I'm all over here on the left now. So if I do stereo, it literally grabs the left one and puts it on the left and the right one and puts it on the right. So what you want to do is always select that input source as the single mono source. Now, that's fine for GarageBand and for things like um, Cubasis and Aurea and other, other apps because you can do that. The problem is, as soon as you open up the camera app, you can't. So if we spin this around, this is going to be a bit uh, inception -y here. Uh, I'll spin that around. We'll go to video mode. So, like I was before, if, if I'm, I'm now talking in this, it's all going to go on to the left. So let's hit the record button, and we'll just show this again. We're all going to be up over here on the left, and uh, if I grab my guitar and play this, that's going to be over on the right, which is no bueno, right? So let's uh, let's stop that one. But unk and uh, come back here. So this is a bit of a problem and a lot of people contact me and say, oh, I've, I've done this recording and now I've got it all on the left and how do I do it and I've got it all on the right. And this is why this is gonna be a, uh, a tip video for an app as well as, or two apps in fact, as well as um, a, a, bit of a, a bit of a tip and a plugin video because it, it, you need to use LumaFusion. The answer to most questions in the world of how do I fix audio and video in iOS is LumaFusion. If you're unfamiliar with LumaFusion, it is uh, a very, very good, very high quality video and audio editing app for your iPhone or your iPad. I use it on my iPhone to edit pretty much every video that you see here on Video Live today. It is the jack of all trades and the master of many, in fact. I was going to say master of none. No, it's master of many. So what I've done is that, that video clip that you saw before, I've brought that into LumaFusion here. And uh, when I play it, if you look at the metering over here on the right, you're going to see that it's all on one side. So it's really cool that your iPhone or your iPad can allow you to plug in a microphone. Not cool. Like we, we don't want that. So if that was me recording that video and I wanted to use this, I don't want all my audio on one side. I want to be able to mix it down. So this is where you've actually got some cool options here in LumaFusion that you can actually change this. So if we double tap on this one, we come in here and we go to our audio settings, which is this one here. You've actually got a bunch of options here and the coolest one here is under your configuration. You can actually go to channels and instead of stereo, you can fill from the left or you can fill from the right. So look at what happens when I select fill from the left. Look at that. Our audio waveform that was just sitting on the left side is now on the left and the right. So if we play that back now using an audio interface but the problem is if you're using a two channel interface it'll only put that audio on the it's left grabbed that and it's brought it into two channels let's grab that little uh, that other little video that uh, i recorded just now and bring that into here as well so if we come up here to my photos we can go to all photos and videos and we can grab this one drag it down into our timeline and like this is obviously just me talking and then playing guitar separately uh, so it's not going to be as cool, but again, if we play this in its natural native form, and uh, if I grab my guitar, there's me talking, and there's a the guitar, and they're on opposite sides. So that's not going to be great. If I'm doing an acoustic cover and I want to just record it on my iPhone camera or my iPad camera, not cool, but it's as simple as bringing it here into LumaFusion, doing that double tap thing. Look how quick this is to fix this. Double tap, audio, configuration, and then go to your channels and fill from the left. 
And that's going to put both your audio, but what? You see the problem here? How's that going to work? You don't want to feel from the left, yeah. You want to actually change that. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can actually, um, the easiest way is to convert it to mono using another approach that I'm going to show you in a moment. But if you really want it to stay within LumaFusion, there is an option here. What you need to do is actually copy over the audio. So to do that, we can actually split out the audio. So see down the bottom here, we've got this little button. We can split out the audio. We then need to take a copy of this audio. So now this video won't have the audio. The audio is here. But we need one for the left channel and one for the right channel, don't we? Or if we want them both in the middle, we need to do this. So what do we want to do? We want to copy this, so tap it, tap it, tap it there, go down here. It's a bit hard to do when I'm uh, on my iPad. I actually use iPhone for this a whole lot more. So we're going to not cut, we're going to copy, and then we're going to go to the very start of that one. Boop, boop, boom. Do, do, do. Like that. And then we're going to paste this in here. Oh, I've got to use my finger. No, uh, we don't quite have the uh, the mouse support for LumaFusion. Oh, hang on, what have I done? I've copied it over the same one. Let's just move this down a notch, and we'll try and paste it in this middle channel. I haven't done this in quite a while, so I'm a bit rusty. There you go. So now we've got the two channels, and if we play it back now, it's just going to be... We're all going to be up over here on the left. It's just going to be double loudness. So we could either just leave this one on the left and this one on the right, but, but what we can actually do is uh, fill both of these... So if we come in here and we do that same audio that we were doing before, double tap. And uh, for this one, because this one was the, the one with the uh, microphone, we can fill that one from the left. And that'll give us all of the left channel there in mono. And then we can grab this one and we can double tap. And you guessed it, we can fill from the right. And then you're going to get all of that audio in dual mono. Now you'll need to do something like adjust your volume here. So if we come into the volume mixer, you might want to turn both of these down because you're basically getting dual mono instead of stereo now so that you're going to get everything. But what we can hear now is everything's going to be nicely down the middle. Uh, if I grab my guitar... There you go, right down the middle. Uh, Jay says duplicate also works. Yes, so there is also a duplicate button, which would have saved me a heck of a lot of time, which is down here. Boom. <laughs> this is why we do this stuff live. So we have awesome folks that can help us out. So yeah, you can also just duplicate rather than go through that uh, copy-paste process that I did there. But yeah, anytime you've got audio, don't stress out, don't worry about it. Just throw it into LumaFusion and it's going to fix it. Now, if you don't have LumaFusion, it is an investment. It's like a $30 app. If you don't want to actually uh, go out and buy LumaFusion, but you still want to be able to convert your stereo stuff to audio, uh, to mono, uh, jump over to the video that I've got linked in the description because I've got a whole video there showing you how to convert stereo to mono in GarageBand or for GarageBand. And the, the trick there is to use a very cool and highly underrated app that you can see me uh, playing around with there. Let's turn the volume down, uh, which is called Voice Record Pro 7. So what you can do with that is you can import audio and then you can save it out. And th that's great for converting from uh, like wave to MP3. It's great for converting uh, at different sample rates. So if you've got something that's say 48 kilohertz, you want to down sample it to 44.1. If you want to go from stereo to mono or mono to stereo, if you want to grab audio from a video and then convert it into another type of audio, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can convert it there. So I won't uh, go into the details here, but uh, if you do want to play around with that, there's a couple of options. So my recommendation is grab yourself LumaFusion. It is it is like the Swiss Army knife. No one has ever, okay, a few people downloaded it and went, oh, I got a bit overwhelmed and I haven't quite used it to its potential yet. But eventually when people start using it, they're like, man, how, how did I survive? How did I actually create video? And how did I manage audio? It's a bit like audio share. If, if there's two apps that I would have, my Desert Island apps for doing what I do in terms of video editing and audio editing, uh, it's gonna be LumaFusion and audio share. I think with those two apps on your iPhone or your iPad, then you're gonna be golden. Uh, yes, yeah, so and there is Voice Record Pro 7. And it's weird, like the best, the best converter, the best audio converter in iOS is actually uh, is actually a voice recorder. But yeah, you can use it as a voice recorder, but it has some excellent conversion things there. Uh, you can also convert to mono running the audio through some of the amp sims. Dan Baker has done vids on that. Very cool. That is a good idea, actually. Yeah. So if you had audio that was just on one side, you could use an amp sim to run it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, again, and it's probably, uh, there's, like everything, there's more than uh, more than one way to, uh, to do pretty much everything in iOS. 
and iPad OS land. Um, we're right on time here. We're right at the end of the show. So I do want to thank you all for hanging out today. I know a bit of an information heavy show, but hopefully you learn a few things. Maybe you learned that uh, you do want an M1 iPad or you don't. Maybe you learned that your poor old iPad Air 2 or iPhone 6S is not going to be supported in iOS 16. But hopefully you've taken uh, you've taken some comfort that it doesn't really matter. Again, these things, you don't always need the newest and the shiniest because you know what we say around here is to to create now with what you have. Like, don't worry about all the things because you can still make great music. Uh, my first album was recorded on my, my first EP was recorded entirely on my iPhone 6S Plus and on using GarageBand and using a Steinberg UR12 and a $50 MXL microphone. And that's it. So, yeah, you can record with whatever you have right here and right now. Well, you can tell by my voice that it's been a long uh, a long week. So, this is sort of my weekend. This is Friday. So, uh, I've got a couple of days off. I'll be watching the Stanley Cup final, which won't involve my Rangers, which actually will make it a little bit more uh, more pleasant, I think, because I won't be quite as stressed. So, I'll be watching the hockey and uh, hanging out. But we will have a couple of additional videos coming out in the next few days. And then we'll be back with what it's going to drop you to after this one is um, Moonlight Thief. Fantastic band out of Germany, a duo. Emily from Moonlight Thief is just wonderful, and uh, you'll hear from her in the Creator Town Hall because we pre-recorded it because she's in Germany, and it would have been at like one o'clock in the morning. So uh, we'll do we'll be we do that as a premiere. So that'll be the next video that you'll see here, uh, live video here on the channel, which is the Creator Town Hall, which will be Thursday evening or Friday morning, depending where you are in the world. Thank you everyone for being here. Yes, don't forget Rockin' Ronnie Ward is up next straight after Garage Band Weekly. So jump on over there. I'm sure he's ready. I'm sure he's got wigs and all sorts of wackiness going on. So uh, do support those folks in the community that do good things. All right. Thanks everyone for being here. Be kind to yourself this week. Be kind to others. Keep creating and we'll see you next time on Garage Band Weekly. Check us out, Gronk Song. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.